We're actually now going to bring in someone from the Trump campaign. We do not have the uh, pleasure of having the president here with us today for this town hall, but we are joined by uh, someone equally special who will be speaking on behalf of the president, and that is Governor Eddie Baza Calvo. He has been the governor of Guam since January of 2011. Governor Calvo has worked in the private sector as the general manager for both the Pacific Construction Company and the Pepsi Cola Bottling Company of Guam. He's from my neck of the woods. He is a graduate of the College of Notre Dame in Belmont, California, and he and his wife, Christine, have six children. I'd like to welcome you, Governor Calvo. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. And by the way, good morning from Guam. Oh, good morning. What time is it there? It's just about six in the morning. So wow. you got I'm going really to greet you. Us. And for all our Asian American Pacific Islanders, I'm going to greet you in our in our language and a bunch of others. Buenas de nafe de, magandan hapon, anyong ha sayo, kanichiwa, and ni hao. Impressive. Thank you, <laughs> Governor. So let me ask you, President Trump, he continues to call the coronavirus the Kung Flu. He mm -hmm. has objected to having a Black Lives Matter mural on Fifth Avenue in front of his building. As you heard Representative Chu saying earlier, the hate incidents against Asian Americans has gone up tremendously since the mm -hmm. coronavirus started and since we started hearing terms like China virus, Kung Flu. Some are saying the president's going back to his 2016 playbook of using divisive language to appeal to his base. And a recent poll shows that Americans are the unhappiest they've been in nearly 50 years, in part because of the lockdowns and the pandemic. The president says he wants to keep America great, but his track record indicates he's more of a divider than a uniter. How will he try to bring Americans together in his second term? And if he is reelected, what commitment will President Trump make to a diverse cabinet and appointees who have a history of understanding and representing AAPI communities? It's amazing you mentioned the word Kung Flu. As a matter of fact, I want to, if you can take a look at history, that Kung Flu comment even came from the Obama administration. So I want to correct you as to who are the authors. That's not true, sir. That's not true, sir. I will say, a uh, Governor, Again, it actually came from people who were waging a public health campaign. It was not linked to the Obama campaign. It was used twice during his presidency when public health his, agencies were trying to fight the flu. Uh, if you can please allow me to continue. But again, it came within the Obama administration. I can tell you with inclusion uh, within the Trump campaign, I'm a part of it. Uh, if you look at the representation and whether it's on the White House Advisory Commission Asia Pacific uh, uh, Affairs, uh, my chair is Elaine Chow. So, you know, uh, I'm here as an Asian Amer American and Pacific Islander uh, to represent uh, the Trump campaign. And I got to tell you something about this division. Uh, if you take a look at what is happening throughout this nation, and you look at, at some of the events, and by the way, as a member of the White House Commission, I've seen what is the impact on some of our uh, Korean American stores, our Vietnamese hair and nail shops, our Filipino restaurants that have been rooted, uh, looted uh, and people robbed uh, as a result of the riots. And I can tell you that when you look at the destruction and whether it's from looting whether it's robbing uh, or burning of flags or tearing down statues, uh, most of those people, not all, aren't going to vote for President Trump. Many of them actually are supporters of the Biden campaign. So as you talk about division, I think maybe especially those within the Biden campaign got to look in a mirror because a lot of their supporters are the ones that are responsible for this. So I hope I can have answered that question. Uh, much, of the, much of the damage is not happening from MAGA or Trump supporters. In terms of what the president will do to have a diverse cabinet and appointees, I understand that you are there and that Elaine Chow is there uh, and that, that is representation. But mm -hmm. what will the president do moving forward if he is reelected? And do you think, and even if it were to be used during the time when President Obama was uh, in office, the term Kung Flu. Mm -hmm. that, are you saying that makes it right to continue using it now, especially given the 
uh, atmosphere of racism and hate that AP, AAPI communities are reporting? Yeah. You know, I think words, you know, you got to be very careful on words. And I got to tell you, my president, he's sometimes very unorthodox and he uses certain words, but he also got to look at actions. And when you take a look at the actions of the Trump administration, whether it's my participation uh, or Secretary uh, Chow, or as a matter of fact, uh, as we go into housing, some of the great ideas that have come from, uh, again, Ben Carson, uh, who is uh, Secretary of HUD, uh, and many others, you already see participation, whether it's from Asian Americans or Pacific Islands. I got to tell you, in, in our advisory commission, uh, and I'm talking the White House Advisory Commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, you got two folks from the islands, actually three, uh, two from Guam, one from Samoa. It's interesting how it expanded as well, because not only do you have Asian American Pacific Islanders from America and Samoa, uh, Hawaii, and Guam and the Northern Marianas, but within this administration, there actually been expansion to our, our, our compact states. And these are, these are nation states that are very, have a very intimate relation with the United States. And I talk about the Republic of the Marshall Islands. I talk about the Republic of Palau. And I talk about the Federated States of Micronesia, which encompass an area of the Pacific of larger than the United States. And it's in the Trump White House that there is actually an effort to work with not only the Asian American Pacific Islanders within America itself, but even with our special partners, such as the compact states, which have a very deep and intimate relationship with the, with the United States. So again, that's another first uh, for the Trump administration. And do you know anything about what he'll do when it comes to his cabinet or his, uh, his legislative choices? As you heard uh, Vice President Biden talking about the number of judges that were appointed under, under his term with uh, President Obama. I'm wondering if you can get more specific about what President Trump would like to do in his second term when it comes to AAPI representation. He's already doing it from home. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, I was going to announce it in my opening speech, but you know, I'm very proud that just two weeks ago, uh, we had a virtual convention. Let's have you that toggle could... then. Um... Oh, I'm sorry. I think someone's speaking over you. Yes. Uh, we had a commencement speech at our University of Guam here, and it was virtual. And it was bit by this um, spoken to these 500 new graduates of University of Guam. This is a young a Korean uh, woman of, um, uh, that was born and raised in Guam. Her family immigrated to Guam years ago. Uh, she's Korean American and a proud Guamanian. And uh, just several weeks ago uh, with President Trump appointing her as an ambassador uh, and the Senate uh, uh, ratifying it, she became the first uh, Guamanian uh, to serve and the newest ambassador to the Counselor Corps of the United States, of the Diplomatic Corps. So that's just another first uh, for the Trump administration. Uh, I can't predict what the pre who the president is uh, going to appoint in major cabinet positions, but I can tell you I've seen in my visits uh, to the White House and meeting with those that are a part of the administration and whether it's in an official capacity or uh, even in the campaign, I'm seeing a growing diversity. I've, I've seen a heck of a lot more even African-Americans uh, that are part of the campaign. Uh, I've seen a lot more Hispanics and of course, Asian-Americans as well. So I'm very confident about things. And again, uh, in the weeks ahead, I'm pretty sure that the president and his people will announce uh, 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 any other types or any other uh, 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 new pros prospective uh, candidate members. And again, I, by the way, I'm one of them. Yes, indeed. So I want to be given this opportunity. I want to be thank everyone, uh, the president, for giving me this opportunity to speak in his behalf. Because yes. really, if you look at Guam, it's a Pacific island, but it's just due south of Japan. So I am an Asian Pacific uh, Islander. I fit every part of the category. And I've got about six different uh, ethnicities running through my blood. So I think I, I can, I'm one of those. But- uh, And Governor Calvo, I will say- see more diversity coming in the second part of the Trump administration as well. 
Thank you. We have several questions from the community for you, but forgive me, I was so excited to get to your questions. I forgot to have you do your opening statement and it's so early over there in Guam. Thank you for waking up early to join us here uh, in the US, so, uh, yeah. on, the mainland, on the mainland, I should say. So please, if you would, uh, just open up you know, and let us know what to expect from the Trump 2020 campaign, please. Thank you so much for that introduction. Hey, and, and I, as I told you earlier, I've given the greetings of several languages uh, uh, that make the constituency of the people of Guam. I can't forget my fellow American Pacific Islanders. So as I greet you all, I'd also like to say uh, to my Samoan brothers and sisters, talofa, and also to my friends and neighbors from Hawaii, aloha. I want to thank President Trump and his campaign team, as well as the organizers of the Asian Pacific Islanders American Voters Presidential Town Hall for giving this me, uh, me this opportunity to speak uh, in behalf of President Trump and Mike Pence. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank our former Vice, Vice President uh, Joe Biden, Congresswoman Judy Chu, uh, and uh, thank them for their not only their present uh, presence but also their public service. Now you know, for uh, many Americans, most of their knowledge of Guam came in August of 2017 because that's a date that North Korean leader Kim Jong-un announced to the nation and the world that he would be launching ballistic missiles in our direction. Now, what most Americans didn't know is that threat was just the latest in a long series of escalating rhetoric and militaristic activities that had been building up since 2012. I, I came in in January 2011, so most of my term was filled by threats by Kim Jong-un. Now, my perspective of a belligerent North Korea is rather unique. See, I had the opportunity to serve as a governor of an American territory that was targeted by an adversary of the United States, both within the terms of former Vice President Biden and then the first two years of President Trump. Under the previous administration, from 2012 to 2016, every year the threats coming from North Korea became more and more bellicose. Every year from 2012 to 2016, the underground nuclear testing became more and more frequent and of stronger magnitude. In fact, even, in fact, even some experts suspected that there may have been thermonuclear detonations. Now, with those bigger explosions also came ballistic missile testing with longer and longer trajectories. Now, it came to a point that not only Guam, Hawaii, and Alaska were within the bullseye, but also potentially the states within the contiguous 48 in the North American continent. Now, then came President Trump. Now, President Trump may not have drawn a line in the sand, but he definitely drawn a line in the deep blue Pacific. No American territory or state would be threatened or attacked. And if this warning was not heeded, then the consequences to North Korea would be catastrophic. Now, that president's blunt warning was also coupled with crippling sanctions and, you know, it is ironic, but also with personal engagement with uh, Chairman Kim. Now, the end result, as I left public office, is that those incendiary threats ended. Nuclear testing ceased. And there are no more missile flights in, in, in a direction of Guam, Hawaii, or the mainland. But I'd like, I'd like to give you another perspective of President Trump. And it's also on his handling of the North Korean crisis that I think is very important. You know, as the president completed that uh, exhausting summit with Chairman Kim in Singapore, he stopped by Guam on his way back to Washington, D.C. And I still remember quite clearly my meeting with him on Air Force One. And though he, not, he hadn't rested from his marathon summit, he needed to ask me something very important. So the first thing the president asked me when we greeted in that typical Trump way, Governor, how are the people Guam doing? Are they, are they fearful? And I said, no, Mr. President, there are no more threats. There are no more tests. Are people doing okay? And then he gave that smile and that kind of confident Trumpian affirmative nod, and he said, good. Now, the reason why I bring this up and why it's relevant to each and every one of our Asian Pacific American constituents is it because it tells a true story behind that Trump presidency and what I think is so unique and special. Now, all of you folks, a lot of folks freaked out about the Tulsa rally. Some said, oh, 
dangerous. Oh, two little people. But I hope they listen to the context of it because folks like me who've been in politics for 20 years, I got to admit it, when I listened to that speech, he is probably one of the most unorthodox presidents that I've ever seen in my lifetime. But you know, while some may question or disagree with his style, the results speak for themselves. Now, the clarity of what President Trump is all about, for me, was made manifest by one statement made at the rally. And I remember it because it st stuck to me. I'm campaigning for the forgotten. That's what he bellowed out. And it made it all very clear to me. Now, I'm going to give a little folks a, a little geography and history lesson. But Guam is the furthest American soil from our nation's center of power in D.C. We're a small U.S. territory. And our 168,000 citizens aren't even eligible to vote for a president. And yet he's called me here to represent the people. He's a campaign. But if there's any one place in America that I guess could be described as forgotten, that could be Guam. Yet this president, who as his aides told me, had not slept in nearly 20 hours, had to stop by in Guam, not just to see me, but more importantly to inquire if our people were still living in fear. And that's probably why I witnessed more progress in our dealings with the federal government in two years working with the Trump administration than six years under the previous Democrat administration. Whether it was increased Medicare reimbursements to our public hospital, treating with Medicaid federal matching on par with subsidies provided to states, relief from federal edicts and lawsuits, and there were a lot of them under the Obama administration, lower taxes, and opening up of economic opportunity zones. Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have gone too long as the forgotten ones. Well, President Trump changed that. And in President Trump's first term, pre-COVID-19 Asian Pacific American entrepreneurship and jobs had grown. Unemployment had dropped to record lows. And even with our nation in the throes of a pandemic, President Trump has signed into law direct funding for subsidizing the unemployed, providing financial assistance to businesses that hit hard as a result of the shutdown, and is paving the way for reopening the economy and stimulating record growth in these months and years ahead. Hey, but before I close, I, I want to just comment on some of the tragic events. I'm thousands of miles away, so I'm watching on TV. And starting with that senseless murder of George Floyd and what led afterward, the sadness, the mourning, the outcry, division, violence, destruction that seems to be engulfing our nation. Now, here in Guam, there is no majority. Like I said, I got five or six races within my blood. But we're rather a compilation of minorities that did hold silent protests and they were held because from every ethnicity in Guam, just to put a focus on a just cause because of that evil act of somebody in a position of power and authority, abusing his power and taking the life of his fellow man. But you know, here in Guam, there was no violence, there's no destruction and there was no burning of an American flag. You see in Guam, for a lot of folks, there's a, a reverence held to that flag, particularly the elderly for the stars and stripes. So maybe it has a lot to do with our tragic history. I'm almost finished, but let me tell you our history. 76 years ago, the penalty for any Guamanian possessing an American flag was to get their heads chopped off. The reason being was Guam was under enemy occupation. I'm blessed that both my parents are still alive. But after all these years, they still remember that fateful day in December 8 when our island was bombed and invaded. They remember three long years of imperial occupation. They remember the slave labor. They remember the beatings and the executions. And they remember that gnawing raw emotion of fear. You know, they woke up with that fear. It went through the whole day until the quiet of night. You know, not this island that was consumer fear there was a bunch of people that still held on to an American flag. You know, that flag was, it was folded. It was hidden with great care and it was preserved. All this done despite the extreme consequences of death if caught. Now, when some of these monomical of the elderly were asked why, it was because that American flag represented hope. It was a symbol of America. And for the Chamorros of Guam, I'm a Chamorro. That flag gave us 
that slim hope to persevere and endure from one day to the next, that someday America would return and would free our people from rape, enslavement, and death. Now, those Guam survivors of World War II or those democracy protesters in Hong Kong who came out in the hundreds or the thousands waving the American flag, all those Iranian college students where the mullahs had put the flag on the pavement who refused to step on it and desecrate it, we all have one thing in common, as diverse as that is. That red, white, and blue is a symbol of America. America is a symbol for their hope. And that's why that flag is cherished and honored by such a diverse grouping of citizens throughout the globe. And for those around the world that hope, that hold that hope, that that's what America symbolizes. And I got to tell you, because I got a lot of friends out here uh, that are uh, uh, non-citizens in Guam. Uh, the pictures of American citizens wrapping burning flags around statues is perplexing and troubling. But for President Trump, that American flag and what it stands for is still worth it. It's worth cherishing and honoring. America's gr America is great. And if you, if you reelect Donald Trump as our president, America will continue to prosper and to be that beacon of hope and greatness for the world. So thank you. God bless America. And God bless those stars and stripes. Governor Calvo, thank you very much for giving us some insight into your role uh, and your connection to President Trump, as you call them, an unorthodox leader. I want to turn it over to one of our questioners. Um, she, her name is Kim Din. She comes to us from Pittsburgh, and she is an immigrant rights advocate. She worked at the Pennsylvania Immigration and Citizenship Coalition. And Kim, I think you're there. Would love for you to go ahead and ask your question live if you are ready. Yes, I see you. Take it away. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Kim Din. I am an immigrant rights and workers' rights advocate working and living in Pennsylvania. Um, I work with diverse communities, including immigrants and refugees from many different backgrounds, as well as low-income Asian and Pacific Islander workers. And so in recent weeks, of course, we've, uh, we've witnessed um, COVID-19-related xenophobia, hate, uh, rising unemployment, rising evictions, foreclosures. We've seen healthcare gaps, continued incarceration and detention of people despite the public health crisis, and of course, the violence perpetrated by the police against black and brown people. Um, and all of this is not new. They are not separate issues. This global pandemic just exposes the huge and existing crisis in America of systemic racism and poverty. There are so many injustices that I see, and I truly believe that all of our injustices are linked as dispossessed people. So my question today is, what concrete steps and specific policy changes will President Trump, if reelected, make in his first 100 days to end this cycle of hate, oppression, and systemic racism of people, including Asian American and Pacific Islanders? Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. And again, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I've seen it firsthand with President Trump and his vision for racism free America. President Trump believes in the people. He doesn't believe in whatever color it is, whether you can vote or not for president. I mentioned. Uh, even our young ambassador, Kim. Um, I think when you take a look at what President Trump is doing, he, he certain steps he's pushing for, he's pushing for school choice because he believes that the educational opportunities of those living in these traditional underserved communities, that's a lot, you talk about the systemic uh, racism or corruption, with some of these uh, uh, failing school systems, he would like to see our people, or those people living in these in these communities, have the school choice uh, for themselves, so that they can put their children uh, into the school they believe is best for them. It's interesting to listening to Pre Vice President Biden when uh, President Trump signed the Juvenile Justice Reform Act. A lot of what that did was to fix the problems that were created by then Senator Biden uh, when he uh, pushed for that crimes bill. And uh, once that crimes bill was passed in 1994, I believe, that was a one way path for so many of our minorities uh, to prison. Now, when you look at the details uh, of this justice, uh, criminal justice reform, uh, 
well, you're, you're eliminating the three strikes. Uh, you're giving more flexibility to judges uh, to make decisions on whether incarceration is even necessary. I got to admit it, I took advantage as a governor. I, I saw uh, uh, the graduates out of our prison there. Uh, there was a group of women that uh, uh, had taken uh, construction and heavy equipment classes. Uh, and a lot of that is a vision of President Trump. Uh, he's even expanded to expanded the Pell Grants to help for the education uh, of our uh, uh, the clients in prisons. Um, you, uh, heck, there's even partly the the uh, uh, identifying of those prisoners coming out so that they have a job when they get in. Uh, with President Trump, there is um, much that he has done in regards to the, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about systemic racism because he's done a lot. But I think when you get to the the, the heart of the matter, it, it, it was best said, uh, a lot of stuff can be done at the federal level. But what can be done is most important in the local level. And there was a interview made by the former mayor of Baltimore. And it was her disappointment. Uh, there was a policing bill that was coming out. As a matter of fact, President Trump had championed policing, a, a police reform bill that would give incentives for uh, uh, the, uh, the payment of body cams, uh, the incentives for training, uh, for uh, non use of non choke holds, uh, unless it, the, the, the life of a policeman was threatened. Um, uh, the mining and, and collection of data to track bad apples. And, but I remember it, it uh, again, the Congress, it failed. Uh, uh, God bless Senator Scott. President Trump was with him, but he couldn't get through the Senate. But there was a statement made by the former mayor of Baltimore. And I can recall, um, she said it has to happen in the local level. And you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, clean out this racist or this this corruption that's within the system. And let me tell you, you have the city of Minneapolis that hasn't had a Republican mayor since 1972. That's Vietnam War. You have the city of Atlanta that has not elected a Republican mayor since 1878. And by the way, history, Guam was still a part of the Spanish Empire in 1878. St. Louis, the murder capital of America, uh, it, it last elected a Republican mayor in 1944. World War II was raging, and Guam at that time was part of the empire of Japan. We seem to be in the middle of all these great empires. Chicago, a city with enough murders to be considered a war zone, hasn't had a Republican mayor since 1931, the height of the Great Depression. It certainly does. President Trump, uh, let me continue. President Trump and Republican Party aren't to blame for the catastrophic failure, failures of these American cities. I'll be blunt. The sole responsibility lies in those Democratic Party bosses that have had control of some of these cities, not only for decades, but for centuries. The Soviet Union had one part, the Soviet Union, I can recall, had one party rule, but it was only for 72 years. Atlanta's had it for 140. So if there's anyone that has blood in their hands, it's those leaders from the murders, the looting, the anarchy, anarchy that has arisen. I, I'm, not sure that that have that, I, I'm just going to tell you, and it's been the supporter, it's been the supporters uh, of Joe Biden uh, that have been responsible for this. And it's those party bosses uh, that have uh, perpetuated control of these cities for decades and centuries. And so, Calvo, just let's be clear. Want, we, we don't I mean, know I'm almost over. I'm almost over. More. If I think President Trump, we reelect him, that'll be the first big step in getting rid of the systemic corruption. But this election, you got to get rid of those party bosses that uh, go to the same cocktail parties, the same fundraisers, the same conventions that have controlled these cities that are collapsing. And that all came from the democratic corruption in these cities, these cities that were controlled by the Democrats uh, for decades, if not centuries. Governor Calvo, let's get back on track here. And I do want to make it clear. I was on track. Know. We don't know who, I mean, on track with the, in terms of answering the questions from the community, which is why we are here. 
Uh, and I, I do want to make it clear, the, the protesters, uh, we don't know who they're voting for. This is your opportunity to speak on behalf of the Trump campaign to this group of AAPI voters, which is the largest and fastest growing group of minority voters. And I want to bring in another live question right now. I just now. got to correct. I think by reading the graffiti, I don't see much love letters to President Trump. There was some graffiti that pre, pre explicit. OK, continue. Let's go ahead and bring in Shenlin Chen. She is joining us from Detroit, Michigan. Shenlin, are you there? We're happy that you're taking part in this town hall and you have a question for the Trump campaign. And there you are. Fantastic. If you can hear us, um, please go ahead and take it away. I know you are the president of the Association of Chinese Americans. Thanks for joining us. Uh, hi, Governor Kelvo. Good morning. Hi. Good morning to you. <laughs> well, it's an honor to meet you online. I'm Shenlin Chen from Detroit, Michigan. I am the president of the Association of Chinese Americans. And thank you for taking questions from the community. Um, Detroit is home to Vincent Chen, a victim of a hate crime and racial killing 38 mm. years ago, just this past Tuesday. Today, the AAPI community is once again being targeted. We are being wrongfully blamed for the spread of COVID-19 despite our efforts, including some loss of lives, to fight a pandemic on the front line. And also Asian Americans have been identified as a model minority. However, one third, uh, like we, uh, someone mentioned earlier, one third of our population is limited English proficiency and a half mm -hmm. of them is foreign born. In our work, we see many underprivileged families and individuals, especially seniors, immigrants, are afraid of getting sick or receiving treatment they need to have in the hospital due to the lack of health insurance and essential language support. So my question for you, and I know that you have uh, mentioned some earlier, but uh, would you please elaborate a little bit on what are the plans at national and federal level to ensure that all AAPI Americans can obtain affordable health coverage through mm -hmm. either Medicaid or ma uh, marketplace with appropriate mm -hmm. language assistance as a priority in your administration. And yeah. if elected, what specific actions will you take to help unify Americans? And what message will you send to help the country heal physically mm -hmm. and emotionally? Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. But it's ironic you mentioned that Detroit, and I, I hate to rub it into the Democratic Party bosses, but the last time Detroit had a Republican mayor, I think was 1962. So again, some of the systemic issues of corruption you see in Detroit has to do with the same folks that meet with President Biden uh, in the convention uh, that are held by the Democratic Party. Uh, when it comes to COVID response, you know, if you take a look at the unprecedented efforts in terms of health care, uh, the president invested $2 billion in community health centers, helping 28 million patients, a lot of them uh, uh, of a minority and Asian American Pacific Islanders. Uh, the president signed legislation to guarantee coronavirus testing, free of cost sharing, removing financial obstacles for Americans who would otherwise be un unable to, to access them. Uh, $2 billion was uh, devoted uh, to support hospitals with uh, high COVID-19 admissions based on their Medicare and Medicaid disproportionate share and un uncompensated care payments. The, ver the, the federal government is also covering the cost of coronavirus, uh, coronavirus treatment uh, for those that can't afford it. Uh, and healthcare, also I'm looking at the most vulnerable. The president is committed to protecting Americans with pre-existing conditions. The president is signing to a law historic right to try legislation, which is giving the terminally ill patients uh, hope that they can try new experimental drugs. The president signed into law the Childhood Cancer Star Act, and that gives about $30 million every year for child cancer uh, research. Uh, the vice president mentioned Obamacare. And uh, folks, you got, you got to recall and look at the historic fact of Obamacare. The last three years of Obamacare under President o Obama, the, the cost of premiums went up by 34%. A lot of that were on drugs. Uh, and I, by the way, I'm in the insurance industry. The um, administration, I guess they made their deal with the lawyers uh, and with big pharma 
Uh, so the scapegoat were the insurance companies, the only group that tries to do, be, do the uh, managing and, 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 and ensuring there's a check and balance so that the healthcare providers and the drug companies aren't uh, gagging us with prices that, that are going up. So what President Trump has done in focusing on bringing the drugs down, prices, FDA has approved a record number of generic drugs for every year of the Trump presidency. The increase in generic drug use from Americans by Americans has saved about $26 billion for the first two of the year, uh, years of the Trump administration. Uh, the president signed uh, legislation el eliminating the, the pharma gag clause. And what, what the gag clause is with uh, pharmaceuticals or with pharmacies is that gag, gag clause prevented pharmacies from telling consumers about the lower price alternative to, uh, alternatives to expensive drugs. Now, the president is also pushing for drug makers to show their prices on ads and taking steps towards uh, importing less uh, expensive drugs from Canada. And if there's any big difference between what the president is moving on and Obamacare, it's about choice. Uh, Obamacare was about single single payer, and we tell you what to, what to do and what to use. This is administration expanded the use of short-term limited uh, duration health insurance plans, S L uh, TLDs which offer more choices at lower cost to consumers. The administration has expanded access to association health plans, or called AHPs, and that make it easier for small businesses to band together to offer better insurance and lower premiums. You know, a lot of our Asian American business, specifically are small. So this allows them, similar to a co-op, to come together, uh, to band together to buy insurance plans. The administration also expanded the health reimbursement arrangements. Those are called HRAs. Now, this is interesting. It allows employees to use money from their employer to buy the insurance of their choice. So you're working from somebody. That company is already uh, providing a, a, a certain amount of money for insurance. Well, it's just saying, hey, we'll take that money and let us, uh, and I'm talking the employee, make that decision. You know, pre President Trump... Um, what I like about him, he understands the intricacies of these complex issues. He's able to address those challenges and provide the meaningful, effective policies to ensure that Asian Americans and Pacific Islander communities are treated equally. But what I like, especially about the Trump administration, I look back as a governor, it seemed from, Was uh, from the previous administration, everything came from the top. That template from Washington, D.C., uh, that way of doing things was thrown to everybody. And whether it's New York City, or again, you go on. The Trump administration is different. It's about more focusing on uh, uh, autonomy, a decision making at a local level. So, you know, it, that in a nutshell is a little bit of what's going to be happening, what's happening, and what what is it, what we plan to see expand uh, with uh, President Trump reelected. Governor, thank you for that uh, information about the HRAs and the expanded access to those association health plans. We appreciate that take. I, I imagine it must be a little bit difficult to speak on behalf of someone else. I'm going to turn it over now to <laughs> co-moderator Amna Nawaz with a few more questions from the community. Amna, go ahead. Thank you so much, Vicki. Governor Calvo, it is a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for being here. Before we go back to some additional questions from the community, I do have one of my own, if you can indulge sure. me. We are, as I mentioned, so grateful you took the time to be here. Um, but we should note that President Trump opted not to come, nor to send a video message, instead to send you as surrogate. Uh, according to the press reports, um, it appears he went golfing today. And according to his Twitter account, he's been tweeting about health care, the Affordable Care Act, and retweeting some QAnon conspiracy theorist accounts. Mm -hmm. We are glad you're here to take questions, but many are wondering, why are you here instead of him? I thought he made it very clear to me, and, and, and uh, it was directed to me. Um, this organization is Asian America Pacific Islanders. I'm thankful that, you know, the vice president has come here, but he's not Asian American, nor he's Pacific Islander. I think it was important for the Trump campaign to have someone here that represented, and you talked about earlier about representation in the cabinet. Well, what better to represent the Trump campaign from a guy from Guam who lives directly south uh, of Tokyo, uh, who has uh, Spanish, Chamoru, a Filipino, a little bit of Chinese, 
uh, blood. Uh, so in, in, in reality, I, I guess I represent a microcosm of the Trump campaign. And what better person to speak uh, for President Trump on Asian American and Pacific, Pacific Islander affairs than an Asian American from the Pacific Island of Guam? That's that's my take on it. Well, just to follow up on that, sir, if you don't mind, many people sure. saw Mr. Biden's participation here as an acknowledgement of the growing importance of this community's voice and, and a chance to court them directly by not hearing from President Trump directly. What is your message mm -hmm. to Asian American Pacific Islander voters who aren't yet sure who they want to vote oh. for and were hoping to hear directly from the president himself? Yeah, well, one thing is virtual. And I guess here I am, it's virtual. In fact, vice president was virtual too. I can't tell you, I know there's been a lot of people crediting, uh, criticizing President Trump, but he doesn't stay in a basement. He goes out there. And by the way, the folks that go to these rallies or these meetings that we've had, they're Asian American. And you're only seeing them in real life, not through a, 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 a screen. So again, for all my Asian American Pacific Islander friends, uh, you know, there, there's the optics, like I said, of you thinking that he's not here. Uh, but then there's the reality that he's out there. And uh, well, you're saying he went to a golf course, but I do know with President Trump, every day he's actually going out and meeting the people. Uh, and he's not afraid to answer tough questions. Uh, he's not hidden in a basement. So uh, I, I want you all folks, you to know that uh, President Trump has so much confidence in Asian American Pacific Islanders that he appoints me to be a surrogate, an Asian American Pacific Islander. Have confidence in President Trump because you know what? He not, doesn't forget the forgotten ones like the previous administration. He'll remember us. That's my answer. Thank you for that, Governor Calvo. I do want to bring in some more questions from the community. Sure. We have some folks waiting, I believe, to get in here. Mainza Tao will be delivering our next question. Uh, I hope that Mainza can hear me. And if you can, please do go ahead and put your question to Governor Calvo. Thank you. Good afternoon, Governor, or rather, good morning. Morning. <laughs> My name is Mainza Tao, and I am a Hmong American from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. representing the Asian American Pacific Islander Coalition of Wisconsin. I was the first in my family to have been born here in this country. My parents and my older siblings came as refugees from the Vietnam War. And a quick little known fact, the Hmong assisted the CIA during the Vietnam War uh, in Laos, thus how we came to be in this country. Governor, much of my career has been spent in economic development and in affordable housing, especially in underserved communities, such as our mm -hmm. AAPI communities. So as you can imagine, I have seen great disparities in these underserved communities in both of these arenas. And especially during this pandemic, our AAPI businesses have suffered greatly because AAPIs have been unfairly blamed for the virus. So this has been a hard hit on our AAPI communities, but also nearly three quarters of our AAPIs who currently live in poverty already, they continue to face extended unemployment. So my question is, what steps will President Trump take to ensure that our AAPI communities are included in the economic recovery and growth efforts? Thank you. You know, um, just before I get into my answer, uh, there's a, another member of uh, the advisory commission, uh, a fellow named uh, Pastor Herman Martyr. And, you know, I, I, I've never had the opportunity to meet someone personally from the Hmong community, but in several of our meetings, the focus is of, 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 uh, of uh, the, the, the pastor has been the Hmong community and how to, to, to get the needed assistance to them. So you have an advocate in, in Herman Martyr. Uh, a little bit of history too. Uh, Guam has always been, the seems to be the place where when some war happens and those that aided America are in trouble, we seem to be that conduit. Uh, in the fall of, of um, Saigon, 100,000 Vietnamese came through Guam and were put up in camps here. And as a matter of fact, uh, some of them chose to live in Guam, raise their families. My, my, my pari, my God brother is married to a, a refugee from Vietnam. Um, and then of course, many traveled uh, or went, made their way back to the United States. Um, would you believe the Kurds even were in Guam? I still remember in the 1990s, 
where uh, our neighbors, there was about five or 6,000 Kurds that came through here. So, you know, we, as, as mo many people don't know about Guam, but a lot of, of uh, our immigrants and those that refugees have come through our island fleeing the ravages of war. Now, you know, all of America, including my island home, prior to COVID-19, were enjoying record economic job growth. There was business creation and, and record unemployment. These same successes were also occurring within the Asian American Pacific Islander community. And then that, that, that pandemic hit. Uh, even in Guam, you know, we were at 4%. Uh, United States was at, I think, 3, 3.5%. Three but what President Trump did, he, he provided rapid and unprecedented, uh, unprecedented support. The island of Guam in itself got a billion dollars in federal assistance. Now, the White House also it provided more than half a million African Americans, Hispanics, and other minorities the comprehensive direct updates on preparedness, response, and mitigation. The president directed the White House Opportunity and Revitalization Council to focus on the underserved communities impacted by the virus. The president signed legislature the legislation that, that provided $60 billion in loans under the Paycheck Protection Program and it and was targeted to a lot of the, to support the minority and disadvantaged communities. The U.S. Department of Education temporary delayed student loan repayment and held interest rates to zero. And thank goodness, I got six kids. And by the way, the last one just graduated two weeks ago. So I saw for her there was a break and she doesn't have to make her first payment. Uh, you don't have to worry about it this year. Uh, so they also provided $6 billion in emergency as, uh, assistance to the students. The president signed to law $1 billion in funding for historically black colleges and universities, uh, Hispanic serving institutions, and many other minority serving institutions that uh, uh, minority serving institutions that had been hit hard by the pandemic. The president signed into law three and a half billion dollars to keep the child care centers open for low income families and for the frontline workers. The president halted evictions on federal government assisted housing and temporarily prevented the foreclosures for some of those FHA insured mortgages. So the president's, you know, his record is clear when it comes to assisting the minority communities. And he delivers and, you know, continue to deliver results in a way which I believe uh, will benefit all AAPI communities uh, throughout our nation. And with him reelected, re -elected, it'll just get better. Dr. Cabo, we thank you for that. We also thank Mine's Zatau for her question. I want to play for you one more question. This one's going to come sure. via video. It was submitted sure. from Munir McJohnny. He is a resident of Georgia. I believe you have that video ready now. And here is Munir's question. Hi, my name is Munir McJohnny. I'm a commercial real estate agent and entrepreneur based out of Atlanta, Georgia. My parents immigrated from India and Pakistan before I had even learned to walk in hopes of a better future for me. They made sacrifices, tearing away from their family and loved ones and swallowed their pride and education, working physically excruciating and minimum wage jobs. While this is my story, the truth is this is not a unique one. It's the story of every immigrant who makes unbelievable sacrifices, not for themselves, but for the generations to come. We were still lucky. I had my parents nearby. As I look at what's going on at the border, my heart aches for those families being torn apart. For Asian Americans in the United States, DACA, family reunification, work visas, and deportation are all very critical issues. Thanks to the sacrifices made by my parents and all of those who came before them, I get to stand here today and ask you, not only on behalf of my family, but for all who've had a similar journey, what immigration policies will you champion? And what laws will you change that are currently separating American families? And will these be part of your first 100 day priorities? Thank you and good luck. Thank you. That's a, I'm going to answer it and I'm going to touch on several topics, but I'm going to touch on the most controversial one first, and then I'll get into DACA. And that's the wall. 
And it has caused a lot of controversy in the United States, this building of a wall on America's southern border. Now, would you believe that what happens between Mexico and the United States, that Mexican uh, American border has a profound impact on places such as Guam, such as the Commonwealth of Northern Marianas, such as Hawaii. And you're, you're probably wondering to yourself, how can this be? How can something that's happening in a desert probably somewhere, somewhere in the Southwest have anything to do with Guam or the islands? But it does. And there's thousands and thousands of our families here in the islands that are suffering as a result of what is happening, destroying lives. I'll tell you a simple reason why. It's because millions and millions of dollars worth, worth of crystal methamphetamine and cocaine are transported. And it's crazy if you hard to believe, but usually through the postal service or through a shipping companies that are American flagged out to our places. And you know where they come from? Places such as California, Nevada, Arizona, and Colorado. Now those American states aren't where these deadly drugs are produced. Those drugs for years have come through those porous borders. They come north, they hit those states and they pollute the families in those states. And then there's, then they're sent to Guam. You know, this year alone, officers, and for you folks that want to defund uh, uh, Customs and Border Patrol, they seized 450,000 pounds of drugs. That includes 92,000 pounds of crystal met. Some of that should, could have come to Guam. Over 1,000 pounds of fentanyl, nearly 3,000 pounds of heroin, and almost 25,000 pounds of cocaine. We had cocaine floating on a, on a barrel here in Guam. Uh, thank you, and I don't know which state uh, that was sent from. Uh, border officers have arrested and apprehended thousands of criminals at the border, including, including members of the MS-13 gang. So you see, President Trump is committed to securing our borders from drugs, gangs, and human trafficking. Now, some of the issues about workplace abuse, well, they come because of undocumented, undocumented immigrants that, that snuck through and that are forced into prostitution or slave labor by bad businesses. So uh, putting a wall up will solve a lot of those issues. Now, President Trump is committed to, uh, to reform and he will prioritize bringing in highly skilled workers to grow our nation. Yet at the same time, he wants to protect American jobs. You know, it's interesting. I recall as governor that we had a skilled labor shortage. Now Guam's only got 8% uh, of our workforce are, are in uh, workforce in construction. Uh, we got about a billion dollars in just military construction a year for the next three years. Uh, we don't have enough workers. We, we graduate maybe a hundred out of our schools a, a year, but we, that's not enough to fill the demand. So it was on the Obama administration that a radical 180 degree turn was on H2s and H1s. So 25% of our construction workforce was wiped out, kicked out of Guam. And what it did was made the prices of housing go up by a hundred thousand bucks. And of course, for the budgets of the military, uh, they weren't going to keep the $8.6 billion budget for the movement of Marines from Okinawa to Guam. That was an act of, of the Obama administration. Well, under President Trump, there's been actually some flexibility. And uh, based on an understanding that there was a need to fill, some of it is because of the military st uh, strategic importance of Guam, but we've got those levels of H2 workers back to what they were. Now, Again, I tell you that, you know, you heard about the pause and you know what? I can understand it. And from the perspective of, of President Trump, Guam was at 4% before. America was at th th three and a half, but now we're at 13.5% unemployment. And the story changes, at least temporarily. That's why President Trump is first and foremost and highest commitment is, is in making sure that all of you, you, you know, you talked about people that need a job. All Americans get their jobs first. Let's get back to full employment. Then we can move forward and, and, and pushing uh, on expanding for uh, 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 work visas. Um, now I want to go to oh, that. If I may, I, I apologize for the interruption, sir. I do want to be respectful of your time and our audiences. But just to put a finer point and follow up on what Munir was asking, uh, you mentioned the pause on those visas, the non-immigrant yeah. work visas. 
we should note that Asian Americans were disproportionately affected by the president's executive order. So if you could very briefly just address the thousands of Asian American families who were affected by that, who will either be forced to leave or be forced to stay separated as a family as a result of the president's decision, what would you say to them? Yeah, I, I will reiterate the, the president's number one goal is to, to move and get merit-based immigration. We need skills in this in this nation. So he's been committed to that, to getting that back. So there has been a pause. And I, I, again, there is a guarantee that once we get full employment back, they will continue. And what the president was very clear is, it's not about the immigrants, he, he, they're important. But his first and foremost priority is getting Americans back to work. And you know, whether it's Indian American, whether it's Chinese American, Filipino uh, American, or Chamorro American, uh, his first priority is to getting these thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people that are currently unemployed, these Americans, back to work. So I hope I have time now to move on DACA, but... Actually, sir, uh, I apologize. We will have to leave it there. I know we spent a lot of time on a lot of different topics, but we do appreciate you being here with us today and taking the time to take these questions and provide us with answers. That's Governor Eddie Baza Calvo, Governor of Guam. Thank you for waking up early to be with us today, sir. We appreciate it. Appreciate it. <laughs> 公共设施和教育在未来十年的发展，立即上2020census.gov，填好问卷，让美国有更美好的明天。事不宜迟，展开未来，即可上2020census.gov/languages回复人口普查。